Um, welcome everybody to UCLA Ideas, uh, to one of our last lectures this uh, year. Uh, my name is Güven Chozel, I'm, I'm a faculty member here and also the technology director of uh, UCLA Ideas. And uh, it is my utmost pleasure tonight to introduce Autodesk and Aaron Ray Hoffer. Um, before I introduce Aaron, uh, I would like to say a few words about Autodesk. Um, many of you know Autodesk as a software development company creating digital tools for the building, manufacturing, media, and entertainment industries. Autodesk is the leading software developer in almost all design fields. So in many ways, as creative professionals, um, we're not only dependent, but also to a certain extent uh, shaped by their products. Uh, as the tools we use uh, since the proliferation of uh, digital methods have become not only standard and a norm, um, but also a philosophy, I would say, in the way in which we define our creative processes. Um, the broad range of tools Autodesk provides not only allow us to have an open-ended and intuitive uh, method of developing forms and relationships, but also allow us to um, test their practical use, performance, uh, methodologies in which we can bring them into real life uh, and such. So in many ways we still traditionally view this as a linear process, I would say, uh, from di digital into the physical. Um, but the proliferation of technologies such as uh, robotics, uh, digital manufacturing, uh, sensors, uh, 3D scanning and such, um, through, through them the boundary has become much more hi hybrid. The relationship between the digital and the physical has become blurred and interchangeable. Uh, the creative process is no longer just a fl uh, flow through from digital to physical, but something that is dynamically linked through continuous feedback loops. Uh, so consequently, the process of software and hardware development has become much more synthesized. As being one of the most innovative companies in the world, uh, Autodesk recognized this trend and can no longer just be defined by software products that we've been, that we've been putting to use. Uh, currently, they have the most cutting edge uh, digital fabrication facility in San Francisco, engaging some of the most innovative designers and artists that have digital expertise uh, through their artists in residency uh, program, uh, providing them a platform to work out their ideas uh, with advanced fabrication tools such as uh, 3D printers and other high-end um, digital tools and uh, bringing, bridging the gap between the digital and the physical further and moreover allowing them a platform to also showcase their ideas. So therefore Autodesk I would say can no longer be defined merely as a software company but a company that provides tools uh, for creative professionals in the 21st century. Therefore, uh, here at Ideas, uh, as we were searching for industry partners to team up with uh, to pursue our educational curriculum and our interdisciplinary mission uh, that is uh, highly related to advancing uh, techn technology uh, for the field of architecture, uh, for the studio that I will be teaching next year here, uh, Autodesk was a perfect fit. So it is my pleasure to announce our collaboration with Autodesk for next year's Super Studio. Autodesk and UCLA Ideas will be collaborating on testing the limits of software and hardware development, digital fabrication, 3D printing in the building scale, and virtual and augmented reality applications, all being explored under this uh, theme of architectural singularity, so to say, where the flow between the digital and the physical worlds are so hybrid that their combination becomes a new contemporary reality. Autodesk has generously agreed to provide our students software and hardware training as well as access and exposure to some of their most exotic tools and cutting-edge researchers who are currently inventing the future of architectural production. Um, so at this juncture, let me talk a little bit about the speaker of this evening. Uh, initially, Phil Bernstein, who is the Vice President of Industry Relationships, was going to join us tonight. Uh, due to a family emergency, unfortunately, he can no longer be with us. Uh, but thankfully, Aaron Ray Hoffer, Senior Industry Program Manager at Autodesk has kindly agreed to present to us. So thank you very much, Aaron, uh, for being with us in such short notice and making time for us in your uh, busy schedule. Um, an architect with 25 years of experience in technology and computer-aided design, Aaron is on the board of National Institute of Building Sciences and co-chair of the Boston Society of Architects Building Systems Committee. 
She is an active member of the American Institute of Architects, Urban Land Institute, CORNET, International Facilities Management Association, Construction Specifications Institute, and Building Owners and Managers Association. Previously, she was the Executive Vice President uh, with the Boston Architectural College. She served as a member of the AIA National Codes and Standards Committee and was on the Board of Directors for BSA as Commissioner of Technology. She led technology teams in academic institutions including Harvard Design School, MIT, and Tufts University. Erin received uh, her Master's in Architecture from UCLA and an MBA from MIT Sloan School of Management. Uh, and she completed her dissertation on green building policy and real estate development and will receive her PhD from Northeastern University's Program of Law and Public Policy in May. Uh, she's a lead accredited professional and is a registered architect in California. Uh, please join me in welcoming Erin tonight at UCLA Ideas. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Okay, so um, thank you very much to the organizers. Uh, as I said, uh, it's really a treat for me to be able to come back because uh, I was an alum of this school uh, many, many years ago. And I guess it's an interesting time because I reflect on the time when I was graduating, when UCLA at that time was really an academic institution that was taking the lead in the application of digital technology in design. It was one of the few places where students could be exposed, at that time, to very, very rudimentary tools. Uh, at least you would probably feel that way today. But when I left school and entered practice, it was interesting because I met many, many practitioners who would say to me, sure, that looks really interesting having a computer in a studio, but why would I ever want to do that? And, and in fact, at that time, nobody was doing that. And over time, I watched the profession transform. It was maybe over a 10-year period where I was able to kind of see the gradual adoption and change in a very dramatic way, a way that none of us really anticipated. And I felt that we were on the verge of a transition like that in 2006 when I was working for one of the academic institutions mentioned uh, in the intro, and at that time, it was a school uh, devoted to design. And all of the practitioners who worked there and taught students there at night uh, were telling the president that they needed to expose the students to building information modeling. And I started to think, is this another wave that reminds me so much of the wave that I saw with computer-aided design? Could it be that the profession is going to go through another very dramatic change? And so I ended up taking a position with Autodesk as, an, as a way to see firsthand and to help um, kind of understand and perhaps drive some of that change. So as a result, I was able to work with Phil Bernstein. Many of you may know him. He's uh, very much out in the public giving presentations, talking about the future. And so that's the subject of the talk that uh, really his whole team has worked on together. So uh, I hope to expose the audience, which I gather is people from all sorts of different backgrounds, to some of the ideas as a way to provoke um, your thoughts on what the future is going to bring. So anytime you put the word future in a title, you're really in trouble, I know that. But uh, I look forward to your um, angry tweets telling me I got it wrong. That's fine with me. So. Let's see, I have technology here. Let's see if I can use that. Did it work? The other side, I heard someone say. Okay, great. All right, so that's good step one. Um, so the ideas that I wanted to talk about actually were introduced very well in the comments earlier because there was a, a comment about digital to physical to digital and those boundaries and there was a comment about hybrid uh, and some of the ways that we work and how uh, a new idea about how that can be a hybridization between different fields 
she holds a lot of promise. So I hope we can kind of talk about that. But the other big topic is disruption. <clears throat> because if you think about the future, and I think about the time when I was in architecture school and we were about to be disrupted by CAD, um, let's think about how disruption may unfold. And so what I wanted to do is give you a framework to think about disruption. So we'll start with the nature, the implications, how one might manage it, and what hybrid ideas about design you could invent. So to set the stage, architects, as you know, we love to go back to history. And so this is a, an example of disruptive technology, which was employed in the Crystal Palace to um, create a building that no one had ever seen the like of before to um, uh, have a space that was several stories high, several, you know, many, many blocks long without artificial light because they used the technology at that time new of strong, cheap glass and uh, they were able to develop structures that would accommodate the exhibition. And today we have a similar kind of uh, result of disruption. So this is a, um, a mall in Singapore where you can see the result of using parametric technology, being able to construct a form that not too long ago would have been very, very expensive or infeasible to construct. So if you think about where the field of architecture is today, and in fact many fields, these are just some images that uh, reflect comments that I've heard from some people in the profession. They're struggling with challenges. Uh, one very hot topic is resilience, which is um, a new form of sustainability, I think, that has become a top of mind for people, especially with facing climate change, facing sea level rise, facing really bad storms facing droughts. So how can we design more resilient buildings and even know that we're headed in the right direction in the early conceptual stage? The other topic is um, the need for energy efficiency, the need to process massive amounts of data. And I do hear a lot of people saying there's an issue with uh, challenging uh, firms to find workforces that are competent to be able to deliver on the expectations that their clients have. So um, the profession still feels, even though the economy has improved since 2009, uh, many people in the profession still really feel under siege uh, from many of these disruptive forces. And so if you think about the way incremental improvement is a bit like the road that you pass, you know, we're reaching a stage where a disruptive improvement is going to allow firms to compete and to be more competitive. And so the nature of that disruption is one thing you can think about, and we break, we break it down in these three categories to help give some order to what may feel like a chaos of opportunity out there that technology offers us. So we start by thinking about disruption in the means of production. So as a designer, you produce ideas or intellectual property, intellectual capital. As a contractor or a builder, you produce a physical object. So the, the nature of that production is changing. The second category is demand, the demand for that building, the functions, the way it would operate, that's changing, that's another disruption. And the third disruption is in the products themselves, which in this case we're talking about buildings, but you could apply it to other manufactured products that you use in your life. So let's talk about the means of production. And the disruptions, you see some illustrations here, for example, uh, you are now able to conceive of your design in terms of algorithms. You're able to think about the energy that is being used. You're able to model the light and the effects in a space. And uh, this one image that looks like spaghetti, uh, colored blue and green, is really a computational fluid dynamic analysis of a surgical room because hospitals have to face um, intense scrutiny around infections. And if you come into a hospital and you leave and you uh, get an infection as a result of being there, their compensation for providing your services is threatened. And so the ability to take a model of a proposed surgical room and to actually see where the particles are going to flow will help 
those designers do a better job at reducing infectious diseases in spaces like that. So that, the fact that we have models allows us to take a great leap. It's a disruption that's not all negative. And in terms of construction, we see lots of examples here of the types of disruptions that uh, students and faculty are developing for the industry. So fabrication, uh, new ways of assembling, building elements on the site. The next category of disruption is demand. And if you think about the two communities that demand design services. There's, uh, you know, we always think about our clients and the people who hire us to do the work, but there's also the huge body of occupants that are our clients as well. Those are the um, people that have demands about how spaces would be used. Uh, you could think about this in terms of the space where you work or where you live. Your expectations for that space are changing and technology is impacting that. Um, the disruption in terms of how clients are asking for their services is something we've seen unfolding through um, new forms of contracts. Clients have always wanted to get more with less, but we're seeing um, you know, an interest in collaboration, an interest in understanding more about I'm the owner of the building. Getting the building well designed is step one, but how can I do better at operating it? How can my business be improved by the data that the, biz that the building can provide to me? So clients are, ch are changing the, their ideas of what they demand from the building itself. And then if we think about the impact of that demand on the results or the products, uh, there are lots of symptoms that we're starting to see out in the marketplace. So, you know, I don't know how many of you have purchased a Nest thermostat, but building products themselves are starting to change. Uh, they're starting to respond to the opportunities of being on the network, of communicating with you remotely. And um, this is an image from a terminal in an airport that was designed to give the owners more data about how fast is it for that passenger to move from this space to that. How are we doing in terms of meeting our objectives for uh, improved service in our business as the owner? Um, I, you know, I read a story about Disney. I haven't been there, but you know, that they're giving um, the customers bracelets so that they can track where people are, where they're spending money, and, you know, know a lot more about the space. So the building itself and the whole campus in that case is going to have to be designed thinking about that as a function. So what are the implications for designers? Um, there's, this is a, an illustration to help you kind of position yourself in this transition. And I've spoken to people who often say, that technology is great, it's for the next generation, it's not for me. Um, that's a dangerous position, we think, because when disruption happens, it's not always um, possible to stay out of the limelight and kind of keep doing things the old way. There's so much competition that it requires uh, people in the field to position themselves against it and to think about where they are. So in terms of competitiveness, the access to huge amounts of processing power, the um, you know better ways of getting capital to fund your projects, uh, streams of data that can be captured and converted and applied in all sorts of ways, um, these are all opportunities as well as disruptions. So we've been thinking a lot about it as a group in Autodesk, and our group includes people from manufacturing, from infrastructure design, from um, construction, you know, people focused on the oil and gas industry. And we tried to take a look at what was common across all of our different fields. Our job is to go out and talk to industry groups and to reflect on what is happening, connected specifically to technology, but also kind of the bigger picture. And we reflected that Autodesk, if you go back in time, back to when I was just about to enter the field and CAD was becoming important, um, Autodesk was taking people through an era that we started to call documentation. Because at that time, technology was really about 
taking work that you would normally do in a manual drafting process and documenting it, making that documentation more efficient. And that era took us a long way. And now you could say that we're in an era of optimizing. So it's not just about getting better at producing drawings and having the contractor understand them. It's about optimizing the objective of my design. So better energy use, better lighting, uh, more efficient circulation. I'm thinking about that because I have a model and it's not just three-dimensional, but it includes information so I can understand what the mechanical systems are, when they need to be uh, maintained and changed out and so on. So now we're in an area of optimization and where will we go from here? So we would like to propose the next era as an era of connection and it's also about understanding our decisions within systems because when you make one decision, whether it's to place a wall or a floor material or the whole um, volume of a space you're designing, that's not an isolated gesture. That's a gesture that exists within a system, a building system, a social system, an economic system, and the connectivity that we have now enables us to ask questions about that. And so I did a little survey with some of our customers to ask them where they are now that they've internalized BIM and they've started to move ahead. And I got some really interesting comments back that led me to believe that um, this was primarily architectural firms, that these firms were already starting to realize that they had assets, they had data, they had things that they had created in the design process that could be very valuable to their clients. So, you know, we're seeing all kinds of illustrations of this happening. Um, you know, 3D models of cities being printed kind of lump this into the idea that we're understanding the connections physically in ways that weren't as easy to do in the past. You know, this is a, an example of a project in San Francisco, um, and this was a precisely modeled and uh, you know, detailed facade that was designed. Is it a, an example of connection? I would say it is because we're reaching a stage where our ideas can be realized through data or information or preferences or precedents that we gather uh, in a much more powerful way than we have in the past. Um, you may have seen these 3D printed um, homes in China And this is an illustration of the idea that, uh, you know, through positions on the roadway, we can access the internet, we can start to communicate. Uh, even the devices in your home today are capable of interacting, communicating, communicating with you, sending you messages. Um, this is an example of an infrastructure project, and the details on this, let me see, this is... Um, an era of connection tool because it allows a designer to aggregate complex 3D information from many different sources in order to investigate you know, the best solutions for this site in the desert. So there's an overlay of different kinds of questions that need to be answered to produce the most optimal design. So we're kind of moving beyond optimization through connection to be able to gather the data we need to be well informed, to have insight about our problems. Uh, this one, I'm not sure of the film. This is a, uh, this is just an amazing example of a firm in Mexico that has gone to such an amazing level of detail and modeling that they create infrastructural elements. They model the rebar in their elements and how it would be produced. And then it is produced and tagged so that the connection here is about knowing at all times exactly where all these components are in the assembly process. So they have a much higher degree of control over their fabrication process. And uh, this is a, a project in New York which is called Hudson Yards. It's a, a massive um, development which is part way uh, completed. It's under construction. And they are um, talking about this as a multi-use, residential, retail, all kinds of functions. And it's also being built over an, an active train yard. And they have titled this the first quantified community. So the idea is that there will be data that will be captured 
through the process of occupation that will be valuable to the owner. So I wanted to um, end with a segment that connects uh, the air of connection and maybe opens up some ideas about what design is, because being from a software company, we have a, a whole cadre of people who are UX designers. Anyone here a UX designer? Curious? Oh, yay, okay, we got, we got a few up here. So we should all chat with you later, because it's, um, if you think about architecture as moving more and more towards um, the systems that we use to interact with one another, I think we can advocate for a hybrid approach to design where architectural designers can learn so much from UX design and vice versa. Because in a way, this space is no longer going to be a mute space that we enter and uh, interact with. It's going to become enlivened by the connectivity that we know is going to, going to happen. It's going to come out of your pockets where you have your cell phone. And, and we know that there's going to be lots of opportunities to um, create uh, interactions that we don't have right now. It's, it's probably happening behind that wall. Even I don't know it today, but I'll be learning about it. So it's taken from an article that was a chapter in a book, and I just wanted to mention Jonathan Follett uh, from Involution Studios has uh, published a book on design for emerging technologies. And um, I was able to do one chapter to try to advocate on behalf of architectural design, because most of the other um, authors were talking about design in a software context for the most part. And if you think about how much time you spend indoors, this is just a, a chart taken from the government that you know, tells you, yes, we spend 70% of our time indoors. And so the building is really moving to a place where it's an, a model of interaction. So when you design that building, you're creating, you have a conceptual model of how people will use it. And your conceptual model is realized in a design or a building. Uh, and so those experiences uh, that other people have when they uh, interact with your model or interact with your building you know, are something that we should really investigate. And I thought it was really interesting to do a comparison. So we look back at architectural history and the um, people that we admire that developed architectural theory. And then you look at some uh, more recent um, ideas about UX design and we see, you know, there's some commonalities that we could perhaps leverage. So um, from HP, there was uh, some principles that UX design, good UX design, should um, be discoverable, learnable. You should be able to understand how to interact with that system when you, when you encounter it, and it should also delight you. And uh, similarly, I think we can look back at firmness, commodity, and delight and see a lot of parallels. And, you know, if you think about genius loci or the spirit of the place, um, how does that translate into the interaction models of the future? So if we have human to machine as one way of interacting, um, in an internet mediated, mediated society, we might have human to system. And ultimately, in a device-enabled built environment, if you imagine what it might be like, you would have humans to machines to machines to systems. You know, it could go, go on and on. But I think it's almost like another uh, dimension, imagining how even just a single room could be enlivened and how you would design it as a space and as a user interface experience. Um, I'm going to skip the case study. I think people probably are pretty familiar with what we did in the Boston area on Trapella Road, which was to apply building information modeling. Now we're um, going to be preparing to move to the city of Boston. We're creating a new space, actually. Hopefully by the end of the year, we'll be um, applying some of these new ideas and creating a, a much larger space that would allow us to experiment in the way that you're doing here with fabrication, um, robotics, and other tools. So if you're in the Boston area, at maybe after January, you should stop by and see how that's working. Um, and so these are just some other examples of the, from Trapella Road, of the types of inquiries that we made of the models, tried to understand daylighting, uh, occupant comfort, questions like that.
And so I think there are research opportunities in future spaces to think about, you know, Internet of Things and the evolution of what that means for design of buildings, design of space. Um, and I wanted to just throw out a kind of a framework uh, to get you thinking about it, because maybe you'd like to do a startup company that would combine architecture with technology. Uh, and, and I thought it was a sort of thought exercise to say, well, what sort of functions could Internet of Things do to help us? So um, we know that there have been, um, you could create sensors that are aware of temperature change or lighting. Um, you might have some uh, analysis that you could do on the patterns of that, like your Nest thermostat, which apparently learns your patterns of behavior. You could also communicate, so there's reporting. There's some kind of action that could be taken to address a problem. Uh, there could be some feedback so that that um, device could learn. And then there could be re recollection, so there could be a way to kind of archive and save that. And then what are the situations that you might want to um, think about and design for? Uh, and I guess the three that popped out for me are environmental, you know, how is the environment doing? Behavioral, do we know how to incent behaviors in the occupants? And social, so are there some sort of network uh, of people, activities that we'd want to encourage? And so if you look at the matrix of those applications and those situations, it's kind of a way of generating some ideas. And it turned out that there are some startup companies in some of these spaces. So it's, it might be sort of an interesting thought problem to say, well, um, I might want to sense the environment. So there's a company, Wide Noise, that senses noise levels. I might want to sense behaviors. So there's a, a way to, I think this is a company, uh, make me sustainable, you know, which is a way to encourage people to behave a certain way, more sustainable. Uh, I want, might want to communicate and report behaviors. So here's one that says quantified self, which tracks behaviors, and so on. So if you kind of look at these quadrants, you could do a design exercise to say, how could I, um, you know, create an analysis of social patterns, and how could I design an architectural space with technology that would support that? So, um, you know, just uh, an example of some things that are really out there now and uh, where they could be situated in the space, kind of the next step of sensors all over that could be um, gathering that data, sending it to a source for ana analysis and reporting it, and perhaps even modifying the uh, architectural conditions. So just to wrap up, um, this was one perspective very oriented towards the building design and construction side of uh, the whole design universe, but Autodesk has a focus on product design, infrastructure, and media and entertainment. So I think, um, you know, as a company, we're very interested in uh, pushing on this theory, pushing on whether this era of connection is, is happening and tracking it. And we hope that um, you, know, you will want to participate in that process going forward and be very interested in hearing your ideas about whether you think this is um, a valid prediction for the future or not. And there's just a few references for some of the work that was shown earlier. Thank you. Okay, so is this uh, a good time Test. for Q&A? Yeah, okay, Q &A. Great. I have a mic here. Okay. So if you want to ask oh, a question, okay. just Questions raise your hand. Here. All right. Here we go. Here's one. Oh, go ahead. Oh, hi. My name is Natasha. Hi. And I first want to thank you for bringing out the idea of disruptive innovation. I don't know if you're aware, there was a book that came last year that was in a, kind of a an update to Clay Kirsten's original idea of disruptive innovation, and I think it came from Sloan, I know that they're for sure from Accenture, uh, the idea of big bang disruption, so uh, even faster, even crazier, and even, I would say, more of a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. So, 
taking that into, into mind, um, I wanted to ask you, is there, can you give us any juice and tell us what is Autodesk's next product for, for integrating, let's, say, let's just take sensors and like uh, bits and pieces of the buildings that will have some intelligence. Okay, um, well great question. So I'm not allowed to say anything that's not public knowledge uh, and they don't tell me those things anyway so I don't have any secrets but I do know that there just one anecdote which I think would be interesting is the um, acquisition or the um, relationship that Autodesk has made with a company called Panoramic Power and particular with a focus on the building owner and how the person who is managing or operating a facility can gain more insight through sensors. So if you want to take a look at panoramic power, I think that that gives you an inkling if you can kind of imagine a time when you have a building information model of your space, you have data in the cloud that you can access, and you have sensors that are reporting to you um, what's happening. I think that's a particular focus on energy, but you know there could be many others. So if you like to play around with Arduinos, for example, and, and uh, see what you can do with an Arduino, there's lots of really interesting little examples. Um, there was an older um, uh, research project that was published called Dasher, which was also related to our uh, Toronto office. They censored it. They used it to create very interesting visual reports on occupant comfort and heat and whether spaces were too cold. So I think, you know, right now we're at a pretty fundamental level, but I've also seen examples from other companies of just looking at uh, you know, circulation through a mall and thinking about security, which is a big topic of concern. So uh, I, I can't really uh, break any secrets, but I think you could come up with your own conclusions about where things are going next. Yes? Mm. So there's a question about are we doing research in how we construct buildings? And there is a, a lot of interest in that, I think. One of the reasons that we wanted to create the space in Boston, which is called Build Space, which besides the office uh, component of the uh, uh, building that we're moving into, is it's much larger than what we have in Waltham, and they're going to create a raw space with a lot of tools similar to what we have in Pier 9. But Pier 9, I think there's an emphasis on manufacturing. And so the idea is to take build space in Boston and create a counterpart that would really focus on building construction. So, and then there are a number of research projects that go on with customers. There's a, you know, if a customer is doing something interesting, people who are assigned um, as experts or in the consulting team will sometimes work with them to develop sort of a unique application. But um, that's, I don't know, that's about where we are. Yes? Oh, sorry, he's been waiting and then over here. Hi, my name is Joe Hartnett. I'm a, um, adjunct professor at UCLA Extension uh, in marketing. So there are a bunch of my students. Would you stand, please, if you're from the UCLA IMC class? Just, you know, stand up. I like, hope you're all tweeting. Yeah, on your, Everybody tweet now. On your feet, thank you. I just wanted to show that there's a lot of students here. And so um, what they're studying, for the most part, is, is, is marketing, but, but to a, a certain extent, it's, it's studying, you know, digital measurement of, of media, which is now, you know, possible given all the technology that's available. And I couldn't help but notice the importance of data in your schemata of, mm. of how you're right, doing this. Right. And I would like just sort of, can you relate it in some sense to what might be meaningful to them, particularly mm -hmm. as they, for the most part, want to go into the workforce that may be located right here in this new mm -hmm. creative te technological center of Los Angeles. Well, so I, I think that data is a topic that everybody's intensely interested in these days. Um, so what can you do to learn more about it? And data is so important in marketing. I think it's really fundamental. I know marketing teams in Autodesk are heavily um, engaged in looking at all sorts of metrics about what's going on in social media that pertains to our customers or our brand or, you know, messages and so on. So 
how do you capture that data? The problem is the more of it there is, it's harder and harder to find the pieces with value or to convert those into value. You can easily be swarmed by data. So um, I think that's one of the most interesting problems that we have as designers in front of us, actually, um, is to think about if you could ha know anything you wanted to about a space you were going to design or a space you did design and you want to know, did it perform as you expected, what would you want to capture and how would you do it? And I think that's um, kind of an interesting question. I'm actually um, taking an online course in data science because I thought it would be pretty important. And it's essentially a, stati a statistics course, which is not easy, you know, but it's important for us to understand. So um, I have a homework assignment that I have to do by Sunday, which is to convert uh, data about hospitals and to read uh, about the outcomes of those particular hospitals and to factor that into a program that will do a statistical analysis and tell me which hospitals were doing better and why. And so that's pretty related to architecture, it seems to me. So that's looking at outcomes. What if you could look at other data going in? I mean, with the surgical example, uh, we had some really interesting conversations with uh, researchers around surgical rooms. And uh, one of the researchers uh, talked about a project where they had gathered data about particulate um, presence of particles in a space over time in different conditions. So they w needed that data to help them understand um, which rooms were safe, how the air should flow. You know, so there's so many opportunities, but you have to figure out what your objective is first uh, and then start to gather that information. Otherwise, it's, you know, not, never going to get to the end of that problem. So, but I'm all for the data, I think. that, uh, But we have to master it, you know? Yeah. I have a question related to that. The, um, in particular, A360 as a, let's say, as a database platform, and the distinctions between that, is Autodesk starting to recognize A360 in the same way Oracle recognizes its information as far as P6 is in an, a, a tool that's in itself, you create through querying the database, Hmm. and you develop the logic of the, the project through the querying and through the restructuring of the data that's already stored, as opposed to hmm. storage as the place where you create from a software. I'm not sure I really understand the question. <laughs> so, Could you give me an example? So, for example, when, let's just say, a 3D model sits inside a schedule tool, and you start to still build the 3D elements and develop them, but they're sitting in uh, a um, schedule tool. And the most uh, prevalent example is probably Synchro, P6, and, and, and Revit. Mm -hmm. But there's new examples now all the time. Mm -hmm. And you change where you're developing, and you actually change your, your categorization. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and, but the information is actually stored in the server. And that, that kind of, it's a very, different relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I can actually answer that question, but the one um, thing it makes me think of, I think, is this idea that migration of more and more information to the cloud, which I think is underlying what you said. In a way, it frees up uh, the designer and the team to create new organizational structures around the work. You know, if the work resides in a way that you could then parse it out to different people at different times. And, and um, you know, I'm not sure exactly how much flexibility there is for the components to be aggregated and disaggregated. It sounds like what you're saying is, you know, are we moving to a, I think the air of connection is right now it's a conceptual, it's not like a product uh, description, but the con concept of it is that there would be disaggregation in a way that would give a strength to a person who can understand the system. You know, the problem is, if you think of the old style of uh, model or drawing, it's very fixed, you know, you have less access to be able to um, kind of recombine or even 
uh, flexibly design things in a tool like Dynamo type of algorithmic tool. So I think that the design interest in moving in that direction and even having more and more flexible spaces themselves does suggest that, you know, if I understand you correctly, that we well, might be headed that way. More in the past, you, you actually changed the data in order to create your presentation of it. I can take the same data in Oracle, even including 3D data from Revit, mm -hmm. and have a presentation that's using live data that six other people are presenting in completely different ways, right. as opposed to in the past, you would store data in the cloud, yeah. but you stored the same representation of it because it was, it was consolidated into a single mm -hmm. existence, as opposed to like the actual use of the cloud, mm -hmm. which doesn't have to re reconstruct it right. in a finite. So it's like the existence. meaning of the element can be um, less rigid the element can be interpreted differently. Yeah, at all times. Yeah. To different people and different members of right. the team. Mm -hmm. But it still shares connectivity and it still updates and recognizes change from other people. Right. From, let's say costing, scheduling, without having to recognize it explicitly. Mm -hmm. The data recognizes it. So I can't really speak to what Autodesk is working on, but I would say that as an idea, that's a really interesting concept in terms of how to design, you know, where would the elements be, where would the boundaries be, and what is fixed. You know, you'd have to have some standards. I mean, then it kind of gets to the question of how much flexibility is there in interpreting. You know, if you put an element in, is that something that other people would understand, you know? Is there, is it so flexible that... We'll take two more questions. Okay, we'll talk okay. later. All right. Um, who else wants to ask a question to Aaron? Or a joke is good. Someone will. Okay. Someone way in the back. Hey. Um, so I guess I was wondering how you see biology and the biotic world and the natural world fitting into um, concepts of algorithmic uh, technologies and proceduralism. Well, there are some really interesting um, projects going on in labs. Are you, I don't know if you uh, have been looking at labs, but if you go to Autodesk Labs, there are a number of um, researchers, and uh, there was a person that I met, his name is, Car I think it's Carlos Alguin, and he had done some, a couple of really interesting projects around um, like the biome of a hospital. And he had been working with some researchers at a couple of institutions to, track that and map that and to think about um, biological metaphors for creating uh, fabricated molecules and structures. So I think I myself am not working on those projects, but I would encourage you to go to the labs site and if you want, I can take your name and uh, send you a link or something. Um, or if you post it, you know, I can give you some links here to some of the research projects that people are doing that are on those, you know, very um, strong interest in genetic algorithms, for example. So maybe that's in line. Um, I guess, so the other guy was asking, kind of, we build these models that are like these canonical models that then get taken by a contractor and turned into a reality. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's this whole idea of shearing layers in uh, architecture and that idea that something has a life cycle and that it has, I mean, I guess my point is that architecture lives in a, bio, a biological world. Mm. Um, so maybe... Are there projects that are going on that are not necessarily taking influence from biology, but considering the biological mm. implementation of architecture? Well, the other one that, that makes me think of is a group called The Living. Um, you might check that out. And I, the Autodesk has a relationship with that group, and I feel that their design work is very much in line with some of the ideas that you have there around, uh, you know, bricks that replicate themselves and kind of more of a biological growing idea of architecture than construction. So you might check out the living and uh, the connection with Autodesk, which I believe acquired them last year, actually, which is interesting, I think. So they're doing all kinds of things. So we'll take one last question, Person. and if you're interested in chatting some more, we'll, we're all invited to uh, stay for drinks after. So, last question. 
This is more of a comment than a question, and I only jumped in with it because there wasn't a huge demand for questions. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Autodesk, and I hope that you'll pass this back to your people at headquarters. Okay. As a student of design, I am so grateful to have received free software from Autodesk. Okay. The fact that I can get AutoCAD and Revit and Inventor and Great. anything else I want. It's amazing, and it's unprecedented, and thank you so much for okay. that. Okay, well, I can't take credit for that, but I will pass it on to uh, Actually, that's very nice, because I share a cube with a person on the education team that works very hard to get the products to people, so she will love to hear that. And, uh, and it's great that you know it. And there are lots of things out there, Maya and 3DS, you know, that you could play around with. Okay, I think that we're thanking you for coming and uh, look forward to hearing more. <laughs>